So I'm sure that if you're a parent, at some point in your life, you've learned what it's like to deal with a child who is going through a crisis. And I had never experienced that until a few months ago. My child had just started his second year in school, and he had decided that he didn't like his teacher. Now, there was no real rationale for this. He simply had realized that their personalities clashed. And so one day, he came to me in tears, and he said, Dad, I don't want to go back to school. My teacher doesn't like me. And there, in that simple phrase, I could understand that that yearning which all of us have, that fear which all of us have, that fear that might have kept you early in the day praying, or that fear that goes with you late at night, that fear that made you turn on the television today to our program, the fear of not being good enough. That's what my boy was going through. And so I tried to remind him how God loved him. I tried to remind him how he was valuable. I tried to remind him that he possessed inherent value. He looked at me and he said, but she doesn't like me. So I prayed with him, sent him to bed, and then stayed up the rest of the night figuring out what to tell him. And the next day came. I anxiously, anxiously went to pick him up, and when I saw him coming out of school, he looked at me, and he said, it's all better. His hand was quivering a bit as he handed over a letter to me. I opened the letter and read it. The letter stated that my son had been chosen to participate as part of a special program that his school had. In essence, he was being chosen to be an ambassador of kindness. He looked at me and said, Dad, she chose me. She chose me. She looked beyond all the conflicts that we had, and she chose me. I find it interesting that each and every one of us here has been chosen, regardless of our baggage, our emotional issues, or our brokenness, to serve as an ambassador of kindness. And sometimes, all it takes is a second touch. So I'd like to take you with me to one of my favorite stories in Scripture. It is found in the Gospel of Mark, a tale intent in portraying Jesus as a man of action. In the eighth chapter, Jesus heals a blind man. But what is interesting is the process that Christ uses to provide wholeness and healing. Now, permit me to present a bit of the context of our story in Mark. You see, as the text reads, we have just left Jesus dealing with some conflict with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They have come to a halt, all these issues that both parties are having. Jesus is focused on looking at people as ends in themselves, is in opposition to the Pharisees' understanding of looking at the world on the basis of rules and principles. And so here Jesus is, again fighting that good fight. Well, the disciples come up to him, and Jesus tells them, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Mark recounts that the disciples think that Jesus is actually thinking about bread, which is funny. Because if you read the Gospel of Mark, you will realize that Jesus just finished feeding a multitude of 4,000 people. So Jesus turns, frustrated, looks at them, and asks this poignant question of them in chapter 8, verse 21. He says, how is it that you do not yet understand? Immediately after that is our story. Mark paints this beautiful picture of Jesus walking into Bethsaida and people bringing to him a blind man. Jesus looks at the blind man and the blind man begs him, please touch me. So Jesus gently leads this man by the hand, takes him out of the town, and then decides to do something rather curious. Rather than speaking the man into wholeness, Jesus decides to spit on the ground. 
You see, he spits on the ground, he creates some clay. And then he turns, looks at the man, and actually spits in his eyes. Puts his hands upon him. Now, to us, living in the 21st century, this definitely sounds like something that is non-sanitary, particularly living in this medical community. But what is interesting about the story, as Mark is presenting it, is that Jesus is actually acting like one of the healers of his time. You see, in the time that Jesus is living in, it was said that saliva possessed therapeutic qualities. And so Jesus is acting in the same way, fulfilling the same expectations that anyone would have of a healer. He asks him a question. A question that mirrors the question that he just asked the disciples earlier on in the chapter. Can you see anything? Well, the man says, I see. I see shadows moving about like trees. And then Jesus touches him again. Mark says that he put his hands on his eyes, made him look up, and, we, and his sight was restored. Following this, Jesus will now encounter his disciples once again and ask them a question. He looks at his disciples and he asks the question that really is at the heart of the whole eighth chapter. He tells them, who do you say I am? Well, they begin to give certain answers that fall in line with the preconceptions and the ideas that people would have had of a Messiah. There's a wing of the disciples that say, surely you're a prophet. Maybe you're, maybe you're even Elijah or John the Baptist. While not completely mistaken, the disciples aren't seeing clearly. And so Mark paints this picture in order to create a parallel between the blindness of the man and the blindness that the disciples have. They encounter Jesus, but they're stuck in their preconceptions of how things ought to be. So they see, but they can't see clearly. And then Jesus provides that second touch. And as he does this, he asks again the question that every believer in Christ must at some point answer. Who do you say I am? Almost without thinking it, Peter blurts out, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. It is that moment of clarity which can only occur through the second touch of Jesus' spirit that the church, our country, and you need today. You see, we all have our preconceptions. We all have our notions about how God ought to work, how our church ought to function, how your pastor ought to preach, or maybe how your president or political representative ought to conduct business. Sometimes those preconceptions are helpful. Other times they get in the way of seeing clearly, seeing clearly for mission. Jesus is yearning to give you a second touch. He is yearning to provide your life with clarity, clarity both of purpose and of mission. And all you have to do is be open to an encounter. Reminds me of an interesting story I once heard. A rabbi was talking to his class and asked a question. He said, how do you know when night is about to break and daylight is about to come and shine through? A hand went up timidly at the front of the classroom. Oh, I know. It is when I can tell a dog from a sheep in the distance. The rabbi paused for a moment, looked down and said, that's not it. An eager hand went up in the black back of the classroom and the answer came forth. It is when you can tell that there are dates on the date tree. That's when I can see daylight is breaking. The rabbi shook his head and said, nope, not quite. And suddenly, the class 
feigned disappointment and asked the rabbi, why don't you tell us the answer? Well, the rabbi paused and said, it is only when you can look in the face of every man or woman and see there a brother or a sister looking back at you. Until you can do that, darkness is still living in our midst. Think about your church. Think about our country. Think about the community you live in. And tell me if you don't think we are living in the midst of darkness. How can you combat that? Is there any hope? What can the church do? What voice should people of faith have? Well, friends, what is needed more than anything is that second touch. And trust me, that second touch can change the world. Let me tell you one last story. It is said that after World, I, World War II, in the neighborhoods of Chicago, a Jewish family moved in. They were celebrating the first night of Hanukkah. And so, on the first day, a menorah came out in the window. One candle dimly lighting the dark alleyways. The next morning, there was a crude swastika painted on the door of that house. Disappointed, the inhabitants of the home looked out and realized that maybe, just maybe, persecution was going to follow them the rest of their lives. That evening, they pulled out the menorah and lit the second candle, only to notice that in the window of the home right in front of them, another menorah defiantly lit. Well, morning broke, and this time, two crude swastikas painted on the doors. By the third night, every single home in the neighborhood had a menorah, and swastikas were never seen. Light defeated darkness. So think again about your life, about the world, about our current situation, about your church, and tell me, do you want lightness to prevail? Are you tired of living in darkness? Let go of your preconceptions and permit Jesus to provide you with that second touch. Can I pray for you? Join me. Lord, we live in difficult moments. We live in dark times. And I know that in a home around the world, there is a person yearning for that second touch. Oh Lord, I would pray that you come into their lives mightily, that you might touch their eyes with your hands, that you may restore their eyesight. So where there is hopelessness, may they see hope. Where there is anger, may they see restoration. Where there is brokenness, may they see the wholeness that is available in Christ Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. And it's a special privilege to uh, share a few thoughts uh, with regard to the blessing of motherhood. I'd like to begin with prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you that you created this world. And... Especially, we thank you for, for creating motherhood and putting special wisdom and special devotion in our mothers to bless us and to guide us. Tonight, as we give honor and tribute to our mothers, we pray that you will bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. It is a, probably the highest calling and greatest privilege for someone to become a mother. There's truth in the adage that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. A mother's influence for good through the um, training and discipline and prayer can be unlimited, cannot be measured. Now the history of honoring mothers, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the secular aspect of honoring mothers and then we're going to talk about uh, the Bible, the, the biblical perspective of honoring mothers and then I'd like to share a personal testi testimony, a tribute to my own, my own mother. 
the uh, secular history of motherhood goes way, way back. Even the Greeks and the Romans in ancient times had special days on which they celebrated motherhood and gave honor to them. In England, uh, long, long ago, there was a special occasion. They called it Mothering Sunday, and uh, tribute and honor were given to mothers. In America, uh, the history of honoring mothers goes back about a century and a half. And of course, we're looking forward in a few days to Mother's Day, which is May 13 in America. And I hope that uh, if your mother is alive, uh, that you honor her and pay tribute and praise God for the blessing of motherhood. But about 150 years ago, there was a lady by the name of Anna Jarvis, and she had a burden that something special should be done for mothers. And so she uh, campaigned for uh, a day to be given in honor of the mothers, but her... her uh, Efforts were not really um, uh, given a lot of success. Later, uh, Julia Ward Howe, who is best known for authoring the lyrics to the Battle Hymn of the Republic, she organized a day in 1870, and she called it, uh, she wrote a Mother's Day Proclamation. Again, for the purpose of setting aside a particular day, and in, in this case, she wanted to suggest that the second Sunday of June be set aside to honor mothers. But again, her efforts didn't really uh, meet with complete success. Uh, the previously mentioned Anna Jarvis, when her mother passed away in 1905, uh, her daughter picked up the torch and uh, she decided she was gonna make this a, a very uh, strong effort to try to do something to honor mothers. So Anna uh, remembered a prayer that uh, her mother had offered when she was just 12 years old. And in that prayer, her mother said, I hope that some, someone, some, some time, will found a Memorial Mother's Day commemorating her for the matchless service that she renders to humanity in every field of life. She's entitled to it. And with this prayer in her mind ever since she was 12 years old, Anna, the daughter Anna Jarvis, set about to try to do something. She contacted prominent people, politicians, even presidents like Taft and Theodore Roosevelt to see that something could be done. And finally, in 1910, uh, the House of Representatives adopted a resolution uh, calling for federal employees to wear white carnations on Mother's Day. And then finally, in 1914, Woodrow Wilson signed uh, the law that uh, honored the Mother's Day that we know of today. So the Mother's Day that we celebrate in May uh, each year goes back uh, just a little bit more than 100 years. And we're told that on Mother's Day, this coming Sunday, there'll be more telephone traffic, there'll be more people uh, going out to eat in honor of their mothers, probably more flowers being sold than any other day of the year. We want to thank God for our mothers. And we recognize that being a, a good mother, undertaking that task uh, requires the wisdom of Solomon, the courage of Moses, the faithfulness of Daniel, and the patience of Job. But I hope that your mother lived up to the ideal that the Bible presents as far as what a mother uh, really means. And speaking of that, we go to the Bible to find authority to honor our mothers. And there's a lot in the Bible to uh, speak about uh, concerning that. I'd like to begin by going all the way back to the very first mother. And we know her by the name of Eve. Uh, but if I were to ask you this trivia question, I wonder how many people would get the answer. The, the, the female who was tempted at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as reported in Genesis 3, what was her name? Well, almost everybody would say, well, that was Eve. But technically, that's not accurate. She was not given the name Eve until after that experience. At that point of time, she was just the woman. And I'd like to read from the Bible how that came, out, uh, how that came to be. I'm reading from Genesis chapter, chapter 2 and uh, uh, verse 22 and 23. The Bible says, The rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So a couple of interesting things in this text. First, Adam had just uh, under, under, undertaken the, um, the job of naming all the animals. And during that process, it probably came to his mind that, well, all the animals are in pairs. There's a 
a lady lion and a, and a, and a male lion, uh, but I'm by myself. And I think the Lord did that intentionally to try to c create a, um, a, a curiosity and a desire for a mate. And it was after that that the, the Lord put Adam to sleep, and from his rib, uh, as the Bible tells us, Eve, uh, the woman was created. And Adam gave her that name, woman, because she was taken out of man. There's a little interesting thing here that you could pass by real quickly. And that is that in the English language, which was not the language in which the, the Old Testament was originally, originally written, but in the English language we see a relationship between the word man and the word woman. Woman contains the word man. And it reflects the idea, as Adam was saying, that... Uh, uh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The interesting thing is that it's the same phenomenon in the Hebrew language. The word for man is ish, and the, one, the word for woman is isha. So it reflects that idea that she was called woman because she was taken out of man. There's a, a, uh, uh, a relationship that's borne out uh, between those two words. Now, after the tragedy of sin occurred, when the woman was deceived and the man ate the fruit, um, we have another inter interesting verse that we want to refer to. And that's where we find uh, how, where she got the name Eve. And I want to comment on that for just a minute. This is reading from Genesis 3 and verse 20. This is after the episode of, of the uh, eating of the forbidden fruit and the visit of the Lord, explaining to them what the uh, repercussions of that was going to be. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. I find that to be a very interesting text. Now, keep in mind the, the setting. Uh, tragedy had struck. They had experienced guilt and shame and uh, awareness of their, of their nakedness and all these things. And the Lord had visited them and told them that they were going to have to leave their beautiful garden home. And uh, there was going to be pain in childbirth for the woman, and there was going to be thorns and thistles for the man as he did his farming. So they, they, they experienced the judgment of God, and, and uh, a cloud uh, was, was over them. Nevertheless, there was the bright hope of uh, the Lord forgiving their sin and someday being restored to their garden home. But that's the context of what happened here, that Adam decided to give his wife a new name, and she, he called her Eve, explaining that she was the mother of all the living. And why do we find that interesting? Because Adam could have taken a different point of view on it. He could have given her a different name and said, you're the mother of sin. He could have said, you're the mother of death. You're the mother of the lost and, and all the curses that have come upon this planet, but he did not do so. In a, a spirit of generosity and optimism, he said, we're going to call you Eve now. You're the mother of all the living. And I appreciate that about Adam, that despite the tragedy that had come upon the human family there, he uh, decided to take a positive outlook and said, you're the mother of all the living. In some way, we all trace our lineage back to Eve. We all have the DNA of Adam and Eve uh, as a starting place. Now, one day, Jesus Christ is going to come in the clouds. And we believe that that day is going to be very soon. And one of the great things about that day is that we are going to be able to meet Adam and Eve. And there's not going to be any finger pointing at that point, no recriminations. There's going to be praise for the grace of God that he's uh, taken us out of this world of sin and, and uh, uh, prepared a place for us in heaven. But won't it be something to meet Eve and hear her side of the story? You know, we're not told how long she lived. There's only one woman in the Bible that we know uh, how long she lived, and that was Sarah. But we presume that Eve lived uh, quite a long time, but then the, 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 the day came when, she came, uh, when her life came to an end and she passed through rest. She's been unconscious in the grave, uh, awaiting the call of Jesus. But that day is going to come very soon, and she is going to come out, and we are going to get a chance to meet Eve. And I'm looking forward to that. And one of the interesting things that you can do is you can try to figure out how many greats you need in that, in that chain to reach from you to, to all the way back to her. You know, if you think that there might be three generations in a century, and now we have 60 centuries, there might be 180 greats that you have to put in there before you get to the name Eve. She is my great, 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 great. Anyway, the story of Eve uh, is a wonderful story, the mother of all the living. Now, when we think about how the Bible supports honor giving to, to, to uh, mothers, uh, we, we recognize that one of the commandments, one of God's Ten Commandments written in stone is devoted to that very, that very principle. Honor your father 
and mother, the Lord wrote. And he not only inscribed that in stone by writing, but he lived it out by example when Jesus was here. Jesus gave honor to his mother. He gave honor to his mother uh, by performing the very first miracle, the changing of the water to the wine at Canaan. As he began his ministry, he honored his mother in response to her request to take care of it. At the end of his ministry, he honored his mother by turning to the Apostle John and saying, essentially, please take care of her while I am not here. So Jesus gave honor to his mother. He, he gave honor to his, his parents as he was being brought up. Luke 2 and verse 51 is a very interesting verse that I read it here. Luke 2 verse 51 says, this was after he, uh, they had been in Jerusalem and left there. He was 12 years old at the time. He says, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. He was subject to them. That, that, that just um, intrigues my mind. Jesus, the creator of the universe, the designer of planet Earth, the one through whose mouth everything proceeded. And yet the Bible says he was subject to, he, to his parents. He, he honored his parents. So there's, there's Jesus as a teenager sweeping out Joseph's uh, carpenter shop floor. There's Jesus setting the table, washing the dishes. Whatever tasks his parents gave to him, he willingly uh, and obediently complied. He was subject to them. The king of kings subject to earthly parents. An amazing thought. Our time is fast going, so uh, I'll have to share the testimony of my own mother uh, another time. But let me, let me share this thought here. A little boy came to his, his uh, mother, and he presented her with a piece of paper. And he had written this out very carefully, and this is what it was. He says, for cutting the grass, one dollar. For cleaning up my room this week, 50 cents. For going to the store for you, 25 cents. For babysitting my kid brother while you went shopping, 45 cents. For taking out the garbage, $1. For getting a good report card, $5. For cleaning up and raking the yard, $2. And then he put a tolder there. This was a bill that he'd written out to give to his mother for her to pay her for all the little tasks that she'd done. Well, his mother looked at him standing there. And um, after a moment, too, she took the same piece of paper and turned it over. And she began writing. This is what she wrote. For the nine months that I carried you while you were growing inside me, no charge. For all the nights that I sat up with you, doctored and prayed for you, no charge. For all the trying times and all the tears that you've caused through the years, no charge. For all the nights that were filled with dread and for the worries I knew that were ahead, no charge. For the toys, food, clothes, and even wiping your nose, no charge. Son, when you add it up, the cost of my love is no charge. Well, when the boy finished reading what his mother had written, Big tears came to his eyes, and he took the paper that he had written and, and put paid in full in it. What a blessing it is that God has given to us, our mothers. And we want to praise him and thank him. If your mother is alive, make sure that you give her honor, not just this coming Sunday, but, but many, many times. And uh, if you are a mother, we pray for you, and we honor you, and we thank the Lord for the blessing of motherhood.